Something I'd like to do briefly before we go deep into the next section is show you a little bit of small talk code and an example of how to use it. So I have here something called the Seaside 3.1. I'm running on the Mac here, but we could run this just as easily in Windows or on Unix. I'm going to double click on this icon. It will launch a Faro image environment. So now I am in a small talk programming environment. Here is a welcome some various windows that have been created. Now one of the comments here is Seaside is already running. Oh. Ah, ah okay, I have the wrong thing here. I need to end the show for a moment. Let's see. Now, nope, okay. Still have a problem. Um, let's see. If I go back, let's see. Maybe what I need to do is mirror displays. Sorry, not set up to switch back and forth. Displays, mirroring, and uh, arrangements, mirror. Okay, so now, now we should be all together. Let's see. So here I am in a Faro environment. And I'm going to see if I can put it into a window. So here we find that Seaside is already running. And to get started, simply open your browser. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to open my browser on localhost 8080. And so here I have a window in a browser. So I'm running a web server in Smalltalk. And this web server says, you have a working seaside environment. This is a, a, an area. So I have a counter example. So I'm going to go to the counter. And this is the counter example in seaside, small talk. Very simple component. It increments and decrements a number by clicking on a link. So each time I press this plus link, it refreshes the page with incrementing the counter. So not a terribly sophisticated application, but uh, you can see that it does something here. So how does that work? Well, let's go take a look and see if we can find out how that works. Uh, partly. I'm going to open a hierarchy browser, a class browser, and I'm going to find the class WA counter. WA counter is my counter application in my seaside environment. And so here is the definition of the class, the behavior for these objects. And so we have a class named WA counter. It has instance variables, including count. The counter is the class, and there are a number of methods, behaviors. The behavior for this class is fairly minimal. Initialize sets the count to zero. And render content is the actual thing that draws the HTML code. So here is where we're drawing HTML code. We're saying create a heading called count. If you go over here and look, there's a heading. And everything inside this blue or box is my component, this application that I have. So the heading is the count. And then I create an anchor. HTML has an anchor object or an anchor tag. And the text associated with it is plus plus. So here you can see I have an anchor component with plus plus. And in fact, I could um, view, inspect this thing. 
And so here we have a div that's a seaside example. H2, H1 is the number 2. And then we have an anchor. A is our anchor component. And it has a reference. And then it has plus plus. And then there's another anchor that has minus minus. So that is what we are getting here. So we can look at that. We have our counter. So the code for that is just put up the count as a heading, give us an anchor with plus and an anchor with minus. And what happens if you click on the anchor? Well, what happens if you click on the anchor is it executes a block of code. So here we have a block of code that just says, do the increase method. So increase my counter and decrease my counter is the thing that's going to be done. So we have increase and decrease methods. So count equals count plus one, count equals count minus one. Now if I change this to two and save the code, it asks me to identify myself the first time I do this. So now the increase method is count plus two. If I go over to the application and I click the plus, it's now increased by two instead of by one. So I have modified a live running system on the fly while it's serving web pages. And everything still works, no errors. It just is behaving the way it should. So I can just keep clicking and it will increase. I could come here and I could say 12. And I can save. And then the next time I hit plus, it goes up to 17. So here I am modifying a running system. This is what we think of as a live object environment. I just have a method that says increase, decrease. So again, we have created some very simple components. This entire application component that is displaying this web thing has a method that returns the count, a method that sets the count, a method that decreases the count, method that increases the count, an initialize method that sets the initial count, and then a render content on that just says, so this is the most complicated method here that just says, and this is the actual drawing. And all it says is we want a heading and we want two anchors separated by a space, which is what we're getting here inside this box component, a heading and two anchors. So very simple code, very direct, very isolated pieces. The increase and decrease methods are very simple and well named and they just do what they need to do. Everything else is handled by the framework. So a number of companies are writing very sophisticated applications using the Seaside web framework because they can write simple applications that encapsulate the behavior they want and they can build complex out of simplicity. And rather than having to be very smart people, they recognize the limited power, uh, the, the limited scope of a brain and they build tools that allow themselves to expand their capabilities. So again, the company that I'm here visiting is Texas Instruments. They have hired people in Baguio to work in Smalltalk to help them in their fabrication control software. So they are running their fabrication plant using Smalltalk. And it's, it's doing the machine control processing with this. They find that that is a powerful tool for them. 
Okay, let's see if I can find my presentation again. And at this point, I think we'll just go ahead. Um, We're not quite together yet. I think I need to change the settings back so I'm no longer mirroring. Okay, and then let's try this again. Okay. So, I mentioned that there are a number of commercial implementations of Smalltalk. One of them is Gemstone. Gemstone is a dialect of Smalltalk that is built and sold by the company that I work for, Gemtalk Systems. And it is not simply a Smalltalk programming environment, it is also a database. So let's start looking at the business and customers. Gemstone users include Intercontinental Exchange. As many of these are um, companies in the United States or in Europe. Intercontinental Exchange owns the New York Stock Exchange. And it is the largest oil and energy trading system. JP Morgan Chase is a very large international bank, and they have uh, small talk in their environment. UBS is the union bank in Switzerland. They use small talk. Canadian Border and Customs, um, technology companies, Siemens is the manufacturer of industrial equipment. They have a small talk project. Texas Instruments, I mentioned. Shipping companies, um, some of the larger customers for small talk, particularly in the 90s and the past uh, couple decades, have been the shipping industry. NYK is the shipping line out of Japan. OOCL is a large shipping company. I believe they're based in Singapore. Costco is the China Ocean Shipping Company and they are uh, the largest shipping company in China. So at one time, about 20% of the world's container cargo was managed through small talk logistic applications. Utility companies, Florida Power and Light, the telephone company in Argentina uses small talk for its inventory management systems. H.B. Fuller is a manufacturer in the United States. J.P. Morgan, I mentioned earlier. J.P. Morgan has an application called Capital. Capital is a risk management system that runs some of the most complex financial activities that occur at J.P. Morgan as their bank. And they have a small talk and gemstone system they have approximately 90 developers around the world using Smalltalk. They have development offices in New York, London, Glasgow, Mumbai, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and now Buenos Aires. So they are using complex, very sophisticated financial transactions. So, how is Gemstone different? What does it provide? Well, we've described some of the characteristics of a traditional small talk environment. There is an object space that fits in RAM. There is an object space, but it's visible to only one virtual machine at a time. And it is difficult to share objects between virtual machines. Of course, this characteristic exists in Java as well. When you create objects in Java, you have to have some way of filing them out to put them in a different Java environment. 
convert them to a non-object format, binary, XML, SQL, or something like that. And when the virtual machine exits, your state is lost. There's no persistence in most of these environments. Gemstone is a small talk programming environment where instead of being limited by RAM, the object space is limited by disk. And the object space can be shared across multiple virtual machines. And those virtual machines can be on multiple platforms, hardware, hosts. So you can have hundreds of computers linked together all sharing the same object space and looking at the same set of objects. And it's done in a transactional, persistent way. So we use transactions to commit and save objects. And once they've been committed in one environment, they're visible to another. So it provides a database. So Gemstone is a multi-user object environment. So imagine you have a Java image. Your Java image is only on one computer. It's only visible to one virtual machine. Imagine if your Java objects, or Smalltalk objects, were visible to thousands of virtual machines, all on hundreds of networked computers where you didn't have to store something out to a database. You simply placed the object in your object space, and it's now visible to thousands of other virtual machines that are all dealing with the same object space. You don't have to use a database. The objects are just there. We can support large-scale repositories, so not just millions or Billion, we can support billions of objects. The design limit is for one trillion objects, a thousand billion. The objects can be partitioned across client and server boundaries, and we have optimized capabilities for queries and indexing for large-scale objects. So thousands, millions of objects in a collection can be queried in milliseconds. We have transactional concur and concurrency controls. So if you're studying databases in your computer science, you may hear the acronym ACID, A-C-I-D. ACID stands for Atomic, Consistent, Isolated, and Durable. And you typically study database systems outside of a programming environment as a separate concept where you are dealing with Oracle or MySQL or something like that. And then you will study these concepts of atomic. If does an operation either happens all of it or none of it, but you never get part of an operation if you have atomic. A, C, consistent. It is visible. All the, the, the same values exist and are visible to everyone. Isolated. When you're working with the database, you don't see other people's changes until they've applied them and you're ready to see them. They don't invade your space and your changes don't leak out until you're ready to make them. And then D, durable. Durable means there's a transaction replay log so that if the system crashes, you can replay the log and get back whatever changes you've made, and they will be there. So these are some of the characteristics of a database system. Well, here we have a programming environment that has all those characteristics built in to the programming environment. So you do not need to leave your programming language in order to get to a database. You just have persistence in your object space. We have login and account security. So we control things using user ID and password. When you log into the system, 
as it would be with an Oracle or Sybase or MyS MySQL. You need to use your ID and password. We have services that manage it, so such things as backup, restore are all capabilities that are built into the tool. And statistics and charting for performance. How much does it scale? Well, we've mentioned thousands of concurrent users can work on it at one time. Hundreds of hosts. JP Morgan is running hundreds of machines that each have VMs connected to the same object space. Terabytes of size. You can have a huge number of objects. Thousands of transactions per second. So it scales high if you apply good hardware to it. Concurrency, we can have multiple user sessions active at the same time. So multiple sessions can log in. In fact, each user can have multiple sessions. So you can log into the database yourself multiple times. You can have separate or shared namespaces. Again, a relational database will typically have a schema. And you can share or have an isolated schema. So Gemstone provides namespacing, schemas that are isolated or shared. Changes to an object have transaction semantics. So again, you begin a transaction. You make a set of changes, and then you commit the transaction. Until you commit, those changes aren't visible to anyone else. If you abort the transaction, you get a rollback. And others will never have seen it. And you will be back to an original state, as if you hadn't been doing anything. So commit, rollback, and so on. Concurrency controls, locking. Locking is a common area that is studied in database semantics. We have full capabilities for locking. You can lock individual objects with a read lock or a write lock. If you acquire a read lock, that prevents anyone else from getting a write lock. But other people can still read the object. If you acquire a write lock, then someone who attempts to get a read lock will fail because I've already got a write lock and indicated to the system that I intend to modify this object. And someone who wants a read lock is saying they intend for it not to change. So again, we have the full semantics available for locking. Multi-user, um, we have login, namespaces, system operations, and object security. So each object can have security to say, can we read, can we modify this object? So again, you can set up something so that objects that you create are not visible to other people. Or you can let them read them but not write them. So again, a security that is built into the virtual machine and enforced at that level. Programmers cannot get around that security. It's programmable. So it's not just a database, but again, it's a small talk programming environment. So we have a data definition language that's just small talk. We have object manipulation. You send messages to objects, which as a side effect may make modifications to those objects. You have query facilities. You can make queries against the database or the collection of objects that's visible by sending messages to collections. Con there's concurrency management that is done not through a separate external tool, but built in through message sends. So begin a transaction is a message send. End a transaction is a message send. Commit, rollback, abort. System management. A backup is not something that's done externally. It's done by sending a message. You send the message, do a backup. Interaction with the system is through a C library. 
typically on Windows, this would be a DLL. So you're interacting with the system through a DLL. This is the same way other databases work, typically. If you're interacting with Oracle, Sybase, Microsoft, uh, SQL Server, um, MySQL, you aren't dealing directly with the database. You're interacting with it through a DLL where you're sending messages. There's APIs in this DLL for login, manipulating objects, sending messages. We also have a wrapper for Java that wraps the C library and is a jar file that can be loaded into a Java environment. And then we have a gem builder for Smalltalk is a library that can be loaded into a couple other Smalltalk environments that allows you to interact from one Smalltalk environment to another. And that is a very powerful tool. OK, we've looked at the programming environment, persistence, multi-user. So how is some of this implemented? Well, we have a large object space that is limited by the disk. So how much disk you have will specify how much object space you can have. But of course, disk doesn't perform well. And so like other databases, we will cache recently used or frequently used objects in shared memory. And this shared memory is accessible by all of the virtual machines. So if I've read an object into memory and you want to see it, you don't have to go to the disk. You can see it in the area that's shared. Persistence is like an object systems. We reference other objects. So if it's reachable from a persistent route, then we can see it. And on commit, new and changed objects are visible. So other sessions can see the changes we've made. A database is isolated with repeatable reads. While I am working in a transaction, other people's changes don't spill over into my environment. I have an environment that is consistent within a transaction. Once I do a commit or abort, then I get the most recent view. So system management, online, we can do backups of the online system while it's live. We can do restores, including transaction logs. Shared memory can be used, and that will allow us to manipulate the data more quickly. And we have special optimizations that improve write performance for the disk. You can add and remove hosts in, that interact with the system at runtime. This doesn't have to be all set up before it starts. You can add and remove dynamically. And you can monitor and tune the system for performance. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of a demo now of the gemstone object environment. To do that, I'm going to escape. And then I'm going to go back to the display, and I'm going to start mirroring them again so that we're all on the same page. And then in my Mac, Apple, Mac environment, um, let's see, by the way, the Apple programming language, the primary programming language for the Macintosh today is something called Objective-C. And Objective-C is small talk with a C syntax. So it is small, uh, something that looks and behaves quite a bit like small talk. It's modeled very much on small talk, quite explicitly on small talk. But it can be compiled by a C compiler. So that's our environment there. So I'm going to launch a, micro, a Macintosh application. I'm going to select a database and start it. And this is starting up a gemstone environment on my machine. Now I have a gemstone environment running. And I'm going to go to a Windows environment, 
where I have some tools that I'm going to use. I'm going to launch a Windows application that allows me to collect, connect to this environment. And it's a 3, 2, 11. Actually, I started the wrong one. I'm going to stop this. And it will stop in a moment. And then when that's stopped, I'm going to start up a different database. This is the 330 database. And it's now all nicely running. And then I'm going to go into my client environment, and I'm going to log into the database. And so here I am hoping to log in. GS64 stone 2. GS64 stone 2, 50382. Three three zero Vienna LDM. Well, my Windows machine seems to be misbehaving. I'm going to search for CMD. Ah, Net LDI path. 50382, not found. 50382, so it should be there on Vienna. So let's see if Vienna exists. Ah, we can't see Vienna. Okay, well. Ah, and I think it's a matter of the um, IP address can change occasionally, and so let me see. The IP address is supposed to be 192.168.2.1. So let's see if I change this to 192.168.2.1 and try logging in. Okay. So here we have logged in. I now have a login window. I am now connected to a gemstone database. And so I can execute small talk code here. So for example, if I say 2 plus 3 and display it, it says, oh, that's 5. Okay, So that was interesting, but maybe not uh, terribly profound. But again, it shows us that. And again, one of our examples was 2 plus 3 times 5. Um, and display that. That again gives us something that is a little bit counterintuitive. But again, if you do the left to right, you'll, uh, you'll find that that that's, uh, makes some sense. Um, one of the things Smalltalk has is infinite precision arithmetic. So in most programming languages, you specify the type of an integer. And if you specify it as a char, you get two, 0 to 255, or minus 128 to plus 127. And if you specify it as a small, you get 2 bytes. And if you specify it as an int, you get 4 bytes. And if you specify it as a large, you know, or a lar long, long, you'll, you might get 64 if you're on the right hardware. And if you, you have to worry about whether you're wrapping around. And that wrapping problem is something that is a cognitive load. It's something you are having to think about when you're writing a program. And it's a mistake that can creep in. It's just another detail that you have to carry that if you didn't have to carry, if you didn't have this pebble in your shoe, you could run faster. You could walk farther. Smalltalk takes the philosophy that infinite precision arithmetic. We don't want you to have to worry about how many character, how many digits are visible in a particular type of container. You don't specify that. So for example, 100 factorial 
is a message that you can, factorial is a message that you can send to an integer. And so factorial, of course, is 100 times 99 times 98 times 97. So this is going to multiply it out until it reaches 1. Okay? Here is the result of evaluating 100 factorial. Okay? So this is a large number and it has many digits. How many digits does it have? Well, if we changed it to a string, we do print string, then we get back the thing not as a number but as a string. Notice there's quotes around it. So how long is that string? Size. Well, the size of that string is 158 characters, 158 digits. So this is a way we can say 100 factorial print string size. Now we just have something that gives us that. And this is an example of sending some messages um, in Smalltalk. Smalltalk has a variety of built-in objects that allow you to create more complex things. So one of them is a class called point. A point has an x and a y. So if we were to say 4 at 12 and then inspect it, we are now have a window that is open on an object. We are looking at an object. The object 4 at 12 has x of 4 and y of 12. So this is a way of creating a new object. We created a point object by sending at to 4 with 12 as an argument. So in this case, at becomes very much like plus. And this is something that you can modify the behavior of the environment at, as you're building it. One of the goals in Smalltalk is for you to be able to enhance it. It's particularly valuable in a computer science or a technology environment where you want to explore new ideas. And if your language doesn't have it, you may face some limitations. So for example, um, I'm actually going to log out here and I'm going to log in as a different user because you recall that different users have security for different things and I'm going to uh, give you some examples of things. In Smalltalk, as in many languages, there's integers. So we have the integer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? This is an integer and if you said plus 2, we'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 7. So that's all very nice. There are a few programming languages that allow you to put a comma inside a literal number. Okay? And they interpret, the rule for interpreting literal numbers includes a rule for how to interpret commas. A few programming languages have that. Most don't. And again, comma is the thousand separator in the United States. Most of the rest of the world uses periods. Periods are already used for decimal separator. So I'm going to stick with the comma example. So if I were to say, 1, 2, comma, 3, 4, 5. What would happen? Well, Smalltalk currently doesn't support comma as a thousand separator in its language definition. But again, one of the goals of Smalltalk is that there should be very, very few things that are hard-coded in the language definition you should be able to extend it. So let's go ahead and debug. And here we're in a comma and it says 
small integer does not understand comma, which kind of makes sense. I mean, that just... And again, the way Smalltalk thinks is that I'm treating this as an operator rather than a thousand separator. They think it's an operator, and they think I'm sending the comma as a message, which I am in a sense. So let's open a class browser, and let's find small integer. And let's look at the hierarchy for small integer. Small integer is a subclass of integer. Integer is a subclass of number. Number is a subclass of magnitude. And magnitude is a subclass of object. So here we have kind of a hierarchy layout. And again, there are certain things that exist at certain levels of abstraction. Magnitudes can be compared. Less than, less than, equal, equal, greater than, greater than or equal to, between, min, max. So the behavior of magnitude is it's something that can be compared. Well, dates can be compared. So dates are, in a sense, a magnitude. Times can be compared. Numbers can be compared. So these are all magnitudes because they support the greater than, less, the comparison capability. So what I'm going, an integer has its own set of interesting things that it can do, remainder, quotient, is it odd? Is it even? Is it a power of two? What's its factorial? What's its floor? What's its ceiling? Various bit operations and so on. So I'm going to go into some of the other operations. And I'm going to take a look at, for example, this. So here is the definition of multiplication in small integer. Multiplication is star and integer returns the product. I'm going to create a new method in integer that's the comma method. And I'm going to say treat the receiver as a thousand and add to the argument. So I'm going to answer self times a thousand plus an integer. Okay? So this is the behavior that I want an integer to have when it receives the comma message. I'm going to save that and now the integer has a comma method sitting right there between minus and times and division. So now I'm going to go into my workspace and I'm going to say, what is 1, 2, comma, 3, 4, 5? And it says, oh, that's 12,345. What is 1, comma, what, 12, 345 plus 2. And it says, oh, that's 12, 347. Okay? So here we have added new behavior to a base class. And we've added it as, and it is just as important as every other part of the behavior of the base class. And so we've got something that's right there. Um, so that's, that's uh, the ability that you have to add something to the base class. And integer is not something that is hard-coded in the language. Integer is just an object with a class that defines its behavior, and I can provide the behavior here with it. So, that, 
there's certainly more that can be done, but um, after the demo, and I think I'd like to leave a little bit of extra time for questions and discussion. So um, we can see how that goes. Would you like to, how would you like to handle the questions and discussion? We have some handheld mics or, um, and then there's the mic there. I don't know if you want, if, if the, um, one of the opportunities is for the faculty and the experts to kind of quiz me and uh, press ideas and challenge what, the, what they've heard since they may understand a bit more of it. And uh, certainly if the rest of you, any of you have ideas, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, it is very new for us. <laughs> so it's like the first time we've ever seen uh, the language. I don't know for, for me, yeah? I don't know for the others. But uh, how are you? Is it the first time you also saw? Yes, okay. So we are very, uh, it is really an initiation. Can we see more of the examples, sir? Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, like uh, continue to show us more complicated yes, uh, things. Yes, love to do that. So that we can have more feel about the uh, Okay, so, um, and, and again, you're welcome to ask for specific things, but so let's, let's take a, a look through some of the hierarchy of the class library and the things that exist. So one area that's common, you know, of interest is collections. So many programming environments have a way of grouping, a collection. And so you may have an array, uh, a, a map, okay? So in Smalltalk, in Gemstone Smalltalk, we have collection is a subclass of object. So collection is kind of a high level abstraction and there's certain behavior that is expected to be in collection. And so all collection methods may have the ability to add something to the collection. Um, all collection methods can be asked if everything in the collection satisfies a criteria. All collection classes or objects have the ability of inquiring whether for any instance um, you can convert any collection to an array, to a bag and so on. Um, you can convert collection to a, any collection to a sorted collection, and we'll look at some of these. And then of course we have the iteration, collect, detect, and so on. So collect and then sorting capabilities and so on. But collection is an abstract. We typically have a concrete instance. So array is one of the more common instances of collection or subclasses and if we go look at array we can do some examples. One, we have the ability to create literal arrays so one, two is an array with two elements, one and two. You can send the message class. What is your class? and it will tell me I'm an array. You can say, what behaviors do you have implemented? So this is a way of saying, and maybe um, we'll look at that as, as a list of uh, 38 items. So here, these are the messages that array implements itself. So at compare, build, add last, index of, and so on. So that is again an example of reflection. We can ask an object at runtime for its class 
and then we can ask the class for its behaviors. We can ask the class for the compiled method. We remember we said code itself is actually an object. So we can say compiled method at size. And it doesn't have it, so that may be implemented in a super class. Um, so if I go and look, um, let's say sequenceable collection. Um, class, super class, um, it didn't find it there. So we could say object. So I could just say, um, let's see, collection. No, yeah, we're not doing very well here, are we? How about object? Ah, yes, object, I think. Okay, so object implements size. And so again, implementation. So the object has a selector, it has a class, and it has a series of bytecodes. So this is the way the actual virtual machine recognizes the source code. So we are reflecting on the class and its capabilities by just examining and sending messages. Um, I'm going to look, so let's discuss the types of collection. We again have a sequenceable collection, array is the typical one, an ordered collection, you can add and remove items from an ordered collection. And so an ordered collection provides the stack based. So you can, an ordered collection has add and um, add before, add all, um, let's see, replace, and so on. A subclass of ordered collection is sorted collection. A sorted collection keeps itself sorted automatically. And so I can add things to a sorted collection and they will automatically be sorted for me. The system takes care of that. An interval is something that has from, to, by. So I can see that there's an instance creation for from to by. I can then go and say interval from 1 to 10 by 3. And that will be an interval. I can ask it to convert itself into an array. And it says, oh, okay, well, there's one, four, seven, ten. So it's converted itself to an array. I can ask for it to be reversed. And it's now ten, seven, four, one. So these are messages that I am sending to objects, and they understand how to implement them and give me back something. We have other collection semantics, including, so those are examples of the sequenceable collection. We have unordered collections, bag and set. Set has the semantics of there's only one instance added to it at a time. And so even if you add it repeatedly, you only have one in there. A bag has the semantics that you can add multiple times and it will keep a count of the objects that are present there. So those would be some unordered collections. And then many languages have something called a map. You may have heard of map reduce. Well, the map is, a is the word that other languages use for what we call a dictionary. 
a dictionary is simply a key value pair. And so you can have a lookup by uh, something other than an integer. And so this is used for, for example, name lookup. Or you can create a sparse array out of something like this, where it has n certain numbers are indexed in it, but not all of them. And so it doesn't take up extra room just by having numerical indexes. So that would be an example of a dictionary or a map. So that's kind of a view of the collection hierarchy. Yes, so opportunity for other questions and comments. I'm having a little bit of a headache. <laughs> but actually it's Lots very, to absorb. It, it's, it's very interesting, especially right now you're discussing a little bit advanced topics yes. in object-oriented programming. But uh, does it support primitive types or everything has to be in classes or objects? Okay. It, may, it treats everything as classes and objects. There are no primitive types. So Boolean is itself an object and Boolean has a class. And the class for a Boolean has its behavior. So if I go and I look for true, there's the true class and the true class has um, some behavior with it. Actually, th this one happens to be um, more built into the uh, virtual machine. It, it's presented as a class but there are optimizations that are made below the surface. So small integers are internally implemented as primitive types, but you don't see that. So uh, you saw that I could change the behavior of integer even though it's internally implemented as a primitive type. Um. Yeah, that's, that's really very interesting because it gives you a lot of flexibility in your, you're not really tied down to the syntax of the language. You're not the, tied okay. to the syntax of the language. One of the things here is you can change the syntax of the language dramatically because there are no commands, there are no reserved words. If you wanted to add messages that were in another language, so people often add German. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to program in English. You could program in your native language if you added that behavior to the base classes. If I change the behavior of the base classes, how does it affect the work of the other programmers of whom I'm working with? Okay. You need to definitely coordinate with others. And so if you change the behavior of a base class, or if, if you change the behavior of something that someone else is relying on, they will see that change and it will affect them. So there would be programming conventions where you would want to make sure that you share things carefully and isolate your changes. You might prefer to add new messages rather than changing the behavior of existing ones. So if you change the behavior of size so that it um, did something else, so for example on object there is a size message. Mm -hmm. If you changed it so that it returned the wrong size, mm -hmm. that would break everything. But if you added a new method called my size and that always returns self size plus one, mm -hmm. then you're safe because uh, no one else is using that message. Uh, to some of the students, this may seem over the top, but is it all right if I make the announcement here? About yes, what we're go talking ahead, about? please. 
Okay, so the CS department together with the engineering department, we're going to have a one-day workshop at the IT department, all on sm small talk. We're going to start from the very basic. So those who want to come, it's free. It's going to be on Monday. Monday? 8, 8 to 12. 8 to noon, 1 to 5. 1 to 5. And I promise you it will be basic. Yeah, basic. Um, this, a lot of what we've been discussing here has been kind of higher level computer science lecture. But uh, we, we will start with some basic things. Attendance will be checked for those who won't be attending. Okay, because we have one laboratory which is not really used for classes. So if you don't attend, you have to attend probably your regular classes. <laughs> and uh, uh, by the way, sir. Is this a class for advanced students or is it something where students who are just getting into programming can attend or does the person have to have a background in object-oriented uh, theory? Alan, Alan Kay's intent with small talk and what he did with it in the 70s and the 80s is he used it to teach children. Wow. The, the goal that he has and many of us have and I have, you know, with my children, is the first programming language they learned was small talk. And after that, you know, that gave them the correct perspective. And then they, they could look at anything else and understand how it deviated from small talk. So we have only 40 computers for the first 40 that sign up on Monday. The rest of you probably, if you're interested, you have to bring your own laptops, but it requires installation of some software. So on Monday, we'll be waiting for you. You'll be learning how to talk big with small talk, okay? Yep. So any other questions? Thank you, sir. Uh, somebody is shy. He, they, they're asking if there is uh, just to repeat, an open source, if there is an open source version. Yes, there is. Um, I don't have internet access here, so I'm not able to show it to you. I don't know if you have internet access or you want to bring your computer up or something like that. Um, I can show you where it is. There are a number of them. Um, I put up a slide earlier that... Uh, listed implementations. So for example, here is a list of free open source public domain implementations of Smalltalk. And so I think that we will be using in the class either Faro or Dolphin. So those will be the ones that we'll be looking at. Um, Faro is probably the one that has the most active academic uh, um, materials with it. And um, so if you go to faro.org, and so um, I'm going to bring up a browser and just say, for example, pharaoh.org. And actually, it's possible I could get a... No, I don't think I'm going to be able to get a Wi-Fi here, or I don't have Wi-Fi, but... So pharaoh.org um, is something that uh, you can go to, and if you go to pharaoh.org, there will be a free version that you can download. And you can get access to the source code there as well. Any other questions? Yes. Hello. Good day. Um, in terms of being the, the language is so man, being so manipulated, how can, we, how can it be effective with machine learning? Effective at? With machine learning, if we implement machine learning with this language. Ah, okay. Implement machinery, manage, manage equipment. Yeah. Okay. One of the things in 
small talk, and in any programming language, we might say, it, it would be possible to say that any programming language is simulating or modeling the real world. And so, for example, a bank application is modeling accounts and customers and checking accounts and savings accounts and certificate of deposits. Even a game, we might say, is modeling the real world, even if it's a space aliens game. It's not modeling space aliens, it's modeling your imagination of space aliens. And so it's modeling what you're thinking and it's trying to help you think and imagine things. If you're doing control of systems, what you want is a simulation of the system. And so you create an object for each piece of hardware and you create a message for each control aspect that you can have on that hardware. And so Smalltalk is popular for things like robot control because you can model the robot and then you can model the messages that you would send to a robot and the actions that you would do with the robot by sending messages and by making a very simple abstract representation of the machinery that you're controlling, then you can say extend the arm or move this many centimeters in this direction and you just send a message to it and then at the lower level you can implement something that talks to the hardware. But ultimately of course you have to talk to hardware and if you're you know, in an electronic engineering environment with, uh, you're going to be talking to voltage and sending things. And that's not happening in small talk, but you are building layers so that your abstraction is at a higher level of abstraction. And by having that control, you can interact with things in a way that hides the complexity from you as a programmer. Thank you. Is that okay? Okay, I see is uh, asking if uh, what kind of uh, if it is compatible with different operating systems? Yes, okay. Different operating systems. Smalltalk is one of the early programming environments to have a virtual machine. And the fact that it has a virtual machine that then interprets the Smalltalk programming language means that if you want to port it to another hardware or environment, you port the virtual machine, which is simpler than having to port your application. And so it is possible to write an application on a Windows machine and just ship it to someone and have them run it unmodified on a Macintosh or on a Unix, um, different hardware, so x86 hardware. Gemstone, our product, Smalltalk, runs on the Macintosh. It runs on Linux. It runs on Solaris, um, Spark hardware. Um, uh, Texas Instruments is using a Spark Solaris, so that's a different hardware instruction set. And um, we run on IBM RS RISC architecture, and you can take a gemstone database and move it from one platform to another, and it will just run. In fact, for gemstone specifically, we support communication between different hosts of different hardware type. And so we have some customers that are running AIX and Solaris in a mixed environment. Um, IBM and uh, Solaris Oracle hardware in the same data center running the same database connected to each other. So yes, and um, Faro, for example, is particularly um, friendly to that and it will run Windows, Mac, Unix, Linux, 
Um, I believe that there's a Raspberry Pi version of uh, Faro. Um, so they're attempting to do that. So yes, portable across multiple machines. Um, Java is similarly attempts to run on multiple machines. The joke with Java is write once, debug everywhere. Um, but uh, Smalltalk is much more mature and consistent across multiple platforms. It's very interesting, sir, that it can be run in Raspberry Pi from small machines to uh, big uh, mainframes. S small yeah. machines to big, big mainframes. Um, I'm running Gemstone here on a laptop. Um, as I say, I think that there's people who are running Faro on, uh, on the Raspberry Pi. Um, we have customers who are running in data centers that have very large machines. One of our customers has a machine that is 200 and, yes, yeah, no. So we're now going to be able to look at the Faro interactive programming environment. So oh, it, it, w w when we moved it, it squeezed over. Okay, there. So here we are at faro.org. Where's oh, the mouse? Okay. So Faro.org is the area that we're in, and it's inviting me to join the newsletter, and I don't need to do that right now. Ah, you're running a VNC type thing. Okay, so here we're, we're looking at Faro. It has an immersive programming environment. Um, the IDE and the OS is rolled into one. We were looking at some of that. If you just go to faro.org and click download the latest version, you'll get Faro 5, which is one of the things I have. Um, it's possible we'll be using some of the Faro MOOC for some of our materials on Monday. Uh, there's a Faro massive online uh, course. And um, Faro is available, I don't think they mention here, it's somewhere else on uh, about where, where we can download it. But um, for example, that would be Faro, um, Squeak, is uh, Squeak Smalltalk. This is another implementation of Squeak that has a uh, Mac, Windows, Linux environment. Um, so there's a, a similar one. Um, um, the Dolphin project is available on GitHub. And this is a Windows-only version of Smalltalk, a native open source Smalltalk for Microsoft Windows. And um, it, uh, you can look at the repository, and I think there's a way of downloading it. Um, anyway, so yes, there are a variety of open source Smalltalks. Um, I believe that uh, Faro will be um, something you may want to look at. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, sir. I am an electronics engineering student, and we want to know if the small talk already find its way to robots, or does small talk already have a robotic interface? Because, mm -hmm. sir, in this kind of system, 
it will be easy to program Swarm Robotics, sir. Because, as you said earlier, you, uh, in small talk, you can there there can be many users in in one program. So I am just asking if you already have find your way to robotics. Thank you. So, um, here is let's see. Uh, So here is a presentation of, uh, of uh, robotics that was done at the ESUG conference. I was at a conference in Europe last week, and this was a discussion of small talk as a programming language for robotics. And um, there is a number, there are a number of um, things that are out there. And the um, Mindstorm has some interfaces for it. And uh, yes, so there are, uh, the robotics community is using Smalltalk. For, for some of their interfaces. So uh, we, can, we could find you some things that do that. Yep, quite extensively. Other questions? Uh, I just want to ask the what is the minimum requirement for the uh, virtual machine? I think it's some kind of package. Yes. Um, it, so the minimum requirements for the virtual machine. So again, you have to run the virtual machine in order to get Smalltalk. Um, keep in mind that Smalltalk started in the 70s. And so. Um, when I started programming in the 70s, we were talking about 16 or 32 kilobyte machines. And so um, that's, that's something that you, you, you probably want more than that um, on the modern small talks to, to get it to run well with a graphical user interface. But um, the, in the 80s and 90s, um, small talk was running I have a version running on Windows XP. Um, you know, it can run in, you know, if you've got, I mean, the, the early machines were measured in, you know, megabytes rather than uh, giga, you know, or uh, um, bigger, you know. So I have a, you know, a 4 or 16 gig machine, um, but if you have, uh, if you have a 200 meg machine, it should run fine. Actually, um, I don't know if you've heard about. Sorry, let me let me try one more thing. Um, Um, the one laptop per child is an ambitious attempt to create a laptop that is inexpensive but can and, and then distribute it around the world, you know, particularly in developing countries. And the idea is the goal they had at the time was to make it $100 US per copy, and I don't think that they've achieved that goal, but buying a tablet or a laptop now for one or two hundred dollars is actually quite reasonable. And the one laptop per child initial distribution 
included small talk on it as one of the things because one of the goals, because it was an environment that was very, very flexible and you could build many things out of it. And so um, it, it, was, it was included on the one laptop per child because they um, believed it would be available. Oh, I guess, oh, I see. We're, this opens a new window every time we do a search. Um, so, um, Squeak is uh, an open source version of Smalltalk and there's something called eToys and then the logo Turtle Graphics is all there and um, it is included, uh, eToys and Squeak is included on the one laptop per child. And that again is designed to be very, very small, inexpensive, low power, uh, durable machine. Okay, Roll. sir, thank you. Uh, so when the database uh, thing becomes bigger, yes. does the virtual machine also becomes bigger? Or? Yes, so of course you are going to have memory issues as you create more objects. Now, you can use virtual machine and swap part of the virtual machine, uh, virtual memory. You can use virtual memory in your operating system and swap part of memory to disk, but that's gonna run slower. Again, most small talks, it's best to limit the size of the object space to something that can fit in memory. Gemstone is a dialect of small talk that is built from the ground up to support disk-based object space instead of just memory-based. And so there you can run in a small environment. For example, I have given demos of running Gemstone on a 256 meg virtual machine on Amazon. And you can run the operating system, the database, the application, all in a 256 meg environment on a virtual machine. Amazon provides you a one year free uh, micro slice. And you can sign up for a micro slice of an Amazon EC2 machine and you can run a database on it. I think that that includes a 10 gig disk and so you have RAM, disk, and an operating system, and an IP address with a port. And so you could run a web application in that, in a free environment. So if there's no more questions, maybe we will continue to think about things and ask on Monday. I'll Thank be, you so much for being here. And we will turn over the program to uh, Sir Bikwa and uh, the others. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. And I, I do believe that many have benefited from the topics that you have discussed with us today. And many are still excited to meet you on Monday because we will be talking more about this on Monday. At this point of time, I would like to request the presence of Sir Bikwa and Sir Balila on the stage. In behalf of the Adventist University of the Philippines, we would like to present the Certificate of Appreciation, and I shall read the citation. Adventist University of the Philippines College of Science and Technology, Putingkahoy Silang Cavite, presents the Certificate of Appreciation 
to Attorney James Foster for sharing his knowledge and expertise as resources speaker during the Special College of Science and Technology Majors Forum held at the Finster Chapel on September 2, 2016. Signed, Mr. Levy Bikwa, the Chair of the Mathematics and Computer Science Department. Dr. Edwin A. Balila, the Dean of the College of Science and Technology and Dr. Maryam Pinar Barte, the Vice President for Academic Affairs. Okay, may I invite everyone to please rise for our closing prayer? Uh, before the closing prayer, uh, we already handed the uh, copies of your certificates to the depart to your department chairs. So claim nyo na lang yung certificates nyo, okay, for this seminar. <laughs> Let's pray. Most gracious God, we thank you for the very rare opportunity that we can listen from your servant, uh, James Foster who shared to us uh, important uh, ideas um, that can help us uh, improve uh, and prepare for uh, the challenges ahead uh, academically. Um, I pray that you uh, continue to bless us with uh, wisdom and understanding so we can understand uh, these things. Please uh, bless us as we um, depart from this place and accompany us with your uh, holy angels. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please sit down. I have a very short announcement. Uh, uh, the Adcom, uh, the Adcom met uh, last Wednesday regarding your work education. Instead 